Welcome, and thank you for joining us for today's bestride.com Facebook Live. And today, oh, we're going to be tackling that age-old dilemma of finding the right car for your teenager. Oof, I know. Say it with me, parents. It's a tough one. My name is Eliana Raggio. I'll be your moderator today, and it's my pleasure to introduce you to the guy who has all the answers, bestride.com contributor, Craig Fitzgerald began his automotive writing career in 1996 at autosite.com, one of the first online resources for car buyers. Over the years, he's written for the Boston Globe, Forbes Magazine, and Haggerty. For seven years, he was the editor at Hemmings Sports and Exotic Car Magazine. And today, he's the automotive editor at Drive Magazine. Thank you so much for being here with us today, Craig. Oh my it's, gosh, we have so much to cover. It's always a pleasure to see you. And this is a topic that I'm really excited about talking about. Uh, me too. Um, now, my son is not driving age yet, but we're already starting to talk about cars and driver safety and that kind of thing. So before we actually get started, I just want to let all of you out there know I picked Craig to do this particular topic because he had recently written an eye-opening blog for bestride.com about it. And, and I thought, you know what? Parents need to hear this. So first, before we get even get into this, please tell everyone, Craig, you do have a teenage driver, don't you? I do. You know, I talk about cars and often I don't have those cars, but I actually have a teen driver. Uh, I have one in the house now and I have a son who's about to turn 13 and he's going to be going through the whole process in a few years. So, you know, it's something that we've had to deal with in our house here. And she actually, my daughter has had two accidents in the last uh, two months. One she was driving and one she was a passenger. So it's something that we're thinking about constantly here. Oh my gosh. First of all, she's okay. Yes. She's great. Yeah. M okay. Minor fender benders, but yeah, she's fine. A little shaken up, but, but, uh, you know, for sure it was an eye opener for her. Absolutely. And parents, this is going to be an eye opener for you too. I mean, there's lots more things to consider just, you know, as, as parents, of course, we always think about safety and, you know, um, but, but when it comes to teenagers wanting a car, you know, it's their very first car. And I don't know about you, Craig, but I still remember my very first car fondly. Do you? I do. It was a 76 Camaro and I got it from my dad, you know? Oh, wow. Okay. You know, and it had like no safety equipment on it. So. <laughs> my husband still talks about his first car. I still talk about my first car. And I think, you know, um, uh, you all become car lovers with that very, very first car and you have great memories. But when you're that teenager and it's your very, very first ride, you know, teenagers want that cool factor. They right. want to look cool in front of their friends, right? And now with all this great new technology that's out there, they also want that too. But parents, well, okay, what do us parents want? We want the, the safety and the reliability and of course right. the affordability. So we're trying to find that sweet spot where Teens will love their first car and really take care of it, but parents will get everything that they want. So, Craig, first of all, is there is there a happy medium? Well, it's great <laughs> now, you know, because it, it, th across the automotive sp spectrum, you know, cars are much more reliable than they ever were, right? So whatever you pick in the last decade, decade and a half, they're all relatively reliable. They all have a fair amount of safety equipment. So you're kind of covered there. And then it's, you know, the, the, the things you need to ask yourself are like, you know, is it something that, you know, is it a car that your teen is going to enjoy that they're going to take care of? Right. So if they're sort of emotionally and financially invested in it, do they take it better care of it? And, you know, does it, does it provide them, you know, some, some bit of enjoyment, but is it not, you know, so fast that they're going to kind of, you know, or so big. That's the other thing is like size is a factor too. So you want to give them something to get their feet wet a little bit. That first year is a real challenge for, for new drivers. So yeah, you I mean, I give them the best opportunity to avoid some accidents. I did have a, a, a mother friend of mine who said, okay, well, my child is driving. I'm going to buy them the biggest car I can because the bigger, the better, bigger is safer. But what wound up happening was their child, you know, 
teenage driver, um, wound up just getting into a lot of parking dings. You know, a, a car can be too big right. for a new driver to handle, to maneuver, to figure out where the end of the car is so they don't hit things. You know, so bigger isn't always better in this case, but yeah. but neither is compact either. So it's I mean trucks and full size SUVs, like they're great. They have safety equipment and all that, but they're enormous. Mm -hmm. And you know, get and especially you know, you and I both live on the East Coast. Like the getting into a parking space, pulling into a garage, like everything is smaller here. So, you know, you're much better off with a kind of, you know, a, a moderately sized vehicle that offers some of the safety of a larger vehicle without that, you know, I can't pull into a gas pump without taking the mirrors off kind of driving feel, you know? Yeah. And, and I'm glad you brought up safety because that's the very, very first thing I wanted to hit on. You know, um, you already said those newer cars have great safety features. They have, right. you know, ever improving safety features, but they might not always be affordable. Um, right. And you might not want to spend that much uh, and and get uh, your first time driver a car that's probably going to get dinged a, a couple times in the first yep. couple of years, right? So, so there's newer car versus older car. There's powerful car versus safe car. There's compact versus a big car. And then there is safety because above all else, parents we just want a safe car for our kids that's all we've been doing their entire lives is keeping them safe so craig if you wouldn't mind i'd love to go over what you feel are like absolute must-haves for a car so you're not getting a car too old that it doesn't have these things uh, but you know new enough that it has all of these things and more so let's talk right. about your uh, first of all when you were you know trying to figure out stuff uh, you know, a car for your teen driver, how high on the list was safety? Um, you know, it was high here. Here's the thing though. The, the key piece of safety equipment in any car is a three point seatbelt, right? That's like right off the top. If you can get the team to use a seatbelt. And I, I have to say most are really good about it. Like, you know, my kids, they won't get in a car without without buckling a seatbelt first. And I, I think, you know, we've had this conversation where, um, you know, the, the, they're just programmed to, to wear these things and they're effective. So 45% of, of, um, you know, uh, uh, fatal accidents happen when people don't wear a seatbelt. And that's true with teens when they, you know, teens when, you know, th that are involved in fatal car accidents, 45% are not wearing seatbelts. So like if you can take that right off the top and consistently wear that seatbelt, you've just given yourself a much better uh, uh, chance at survival and, a, and of surviving without, without, uh, without injury. So in both of the accidents that my daughter got into, she was wearing a seatbelt both times, airbags never deployed. Um, you know, she, she walked away from both of those shaken up, you know, some minor, you know, sort of, sort of bumps and bruises, but no, no major, uh, injuries. So that's the key piece of equipment. The, the okay. next thing. Uh, oh, wait, before you go any further, sure. I do want to make sure that parents have this information. If you wouldn't mind, let's put up that graphic one more time because NHTSA, I'm sorry. Yes. They, they said that, and I want to make sure I read this so that y'all have this information. Seatbelts reduce the risk of fatal injury by 45%. They also reduce the risk of moderate to critical injury by 50%. Yet teens are among the demographic group that are least likely to wear a seatbelt. In 2019, 46% of the teens who died in car accidents were not wearing their seatbelts. There is no doubt the science is in seatbelts save lives. So rule number one, must wear a seatbelt at all times. Absolutely. And right. Craig, thank you so much for bringing that to our attention. That is minimum, minimum safety feature. Exactly. And, and it's absolutely the most effective piece of safe safety equipment in the car. So everything that's come after it, traction control, ABS, like these are all things that help you avoid getting in an accident. But the the, the seatbelt is the thing that's gonna it's gonna save you when things go really bad, and you know like one of the challenging things when you're looking at cars for your teens is trying to figure out like okay well in 2021 
this car was exceedingly safe and did well from the IIHS and did well in crash tests and all this. Well, what about a 2017? Because these cars didn't have some of the safety equipment that are in these 20, 2021, 2022 models. So for example, like, you know, there, there is safety equipment now, adaptive headlights that are part of the IIHS delivering a top safety pick plus rating, but that technology wasn't available. So like, are you doing your kid a disservice by not, by not buying that technology? No, make sure they wear the seatbelt. Think of everything else in tiers underneath that. Like all of this technology is, is great and we're starting to see the benefits, but the benefits are almost always, oh, they prevented you know, a rear end collision rather than, you know, you can say, well, somebody's life was saved by, by, you know, by using this piece of technology. So I think that's the key is just make sure they're wearing the seatbelts at all times. Okay. So minimum seatbelts only good if you actually yep. use them, yep. right? Uh, you had and mentioned what? By now, anti-lock brakes have been around you know, since the eighties really, and, and pretty standard, they never became fully standard or required, but they're on everything. And they have been since, you know, the mid nineties. So, you know, that's a piece of technology that's that if your kid, and we'll get into this, if your kid knows how they work, then it can really, you know, help prevent an accident by allowing you to break and steer around an obstacle rather than crashing into it. Um, traction control is the other thing. Like that was the one piece of technology that my daughter's Jeep didn't have that would have prevented her from getting in the accident the first one she was in because she it was wet. She sort of pulled out of a, a stop sign and the vehicle just kind of did a 180 in the road that you eliminate that with traction control and stability control, which became mandatory in the early 2000s. So, you know, the, or sort of mid 2000s. So, so that's a piece of technology that is very helpful. Um, I wouldn't say it's mandatory, but yeah, it's, if you can find something from that era that has that technology, you're, you stand a better chance when the weather is bad. I, I will say as somebody who had been in an accident and skirted away with very, very minor injuries because of an airbag. Yep. I would throw airbag on there as oh, well. Airbags. Airbags, absolutely. And those have been mandatory for for oh 20 something years now. Um and they've get they get better all the time. They get more, they're staged so that they're not exploding in your face as violently as they used to. Um, they, they, you know, they, and, and there are airbags on the sides, there are airbags from the roof and underneath the dash. And, you know, my daughter's has two, she has one in the wheel and one for the passenger. Right. But, um, you know, as you get more modern, there's, you know, it kind of encases you in these airbags, uh, which is a, it's a great piece of technology. Okay. So, so we've covered some basics, but I want to cover some other safety features that, that would be nice to have. Um, you know, you listed them in your article. And if you want to check out that article, please go to bestride.com and look up the blog section of the bestride.com website. But um, let's start with auto emergency braking. Why is that so important? And how uh, is that different from anti-lock brakes? <laughs> auto emergency braking is actually monitoring what's going on in front of the car. So that if somebody stops quickly in front of you, it first has an audible alert and a visual alert usually that flashes something in front of you that says break. And then if you don't break within a certain period of time, it will apply full braking pressure to get that vehicle to stop without you touching the brake pedal. It's a great piece of technology. There's a Chinese study out there now that's that's you know that's saying that that you know there are some pretty significant reductions in injuries and um and collisions. Number. Yeah, and it's yeah. so so it's like it it's technology that's working. It's also pretty new. So especially on cars that you can afford. So this technology originally came out in Mercedes Benz and BMWs and things, and it's filtered down into the Fords and it's pretty much on everything now but it's really been that way only for the last four or five years. So if you want this technology, much more modern vehicle. Okay. Uh, I do have the results from that Chinese study. By the way, that Chinese study is very recent. It was in 2020. Right. And it showed that 
that uh, AEB auto uh, automatic emergency braking reduced the number of crashes by 27%. Yep. That's that alone is incredible, but it also reduced the severity of crashes by 44%. So auto emergency braking is just one of those new pieces of technology that is literally out there saving lives day in and day out. So if you can get it, it's a great thing to have for that new car for your teenager. And hopefully they'll never, ever have to use it. But um, I wanted to uh, talk to you a little bit about something that is actually... Um, I would say it is probably the number one thing that would cause an accident, and that is distracted driving. Right. And I see it every day, and it's so annoying when I see the driver next to me. And, you know, we've all seen somebody, and they're, they're not paying attention to the road. Right. But just so we know, so we're all on the same page, distracted driving is any activity that could, that could divert attention from the primary task of driving. And according to the National Highway Transportation and Safety Administration, distracted driving consistently causes 3,000 deaths in the U.S. each year. Now, granted, that's only about 8% of all accidents that happen. But if your teenager is anything like my teenager, well, their faces are glued to their cell phones. Right. And when they get a text message, they immediately pick up the cell phone and they have to know that's not something that can be done while they're supposed to be operating a car. Now, uh, Craig, I know you and I agree on this wholeheartedly. We actually talked about this on a previous Facebook Live for bestride.com. But what I think is great is that car manufacturers have come out with a number of technologies that can actually help reduce distracted driving. Right. So if you wouldn't mind, Craig, let's talk about some of those because they're really, really cool. But you know what? They're also safe. Yeah. Well, you know, the, the and, the and the thing to remember, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention this, my friend Brian Reimer at MIT would yell at me if I didn't say that distraction is more than just the phone. It's, it's you know, the infotainment system. It's the the attention that you have to divert from operating the car and focusing on something else. So, you know, the, you know, technologies like Apple CarPlay have really become almost standard technology in anything with an infotainment system. And it does help because it, 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 it restricts some of the functions of the phone. So text messages, you can now hear over the audio system phones, you can dial by, you know, but kids don't talk on the phone anyways. They're texting, they're, you know, watching TikTok videos, they're, you know, direct messaging and all that kind of stuff. It, 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 it's a habit regardless of the technology. And you can defeat the technology by just picking up the phone. You know, it's not like the phone is completely restricted. So I would say use the technology that's available, but make sure that you're having those conversations all the time because you know, it's, and it's not just kids, it's everybody doing this, you know, like everybody's distracted by things. Um, it, 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 so, so technology at the moment hasn't solved the problem. It's, it's the problem is definitely an education issue, but use the Apple CarPlay. And if your vehicle doesn't have it, um, you can upgrade the audio system and get an aftermarket audio system. So if you're driving something older, you can have hands-free technology, Bluetooth technology, Apple CarPlay, Android Auto, like all of those things can be incorporated uh, and added to the vehicle. Uh, oh, absolutely. To, to um, I do want to give a shout out to Beth. She wrote in, she said, so true and not just for teens. Beth, I'm with you. I mean, Craig, you and I have been driving our cars for more than I care to, yeah. longer than I care to admit. But I mean, if I want to change the station or, or you know, uh, turn on the air conditioner, I don't even have to take my eyes off the road. I right. can feel around, figure it out, and do it without being distracted. I'm not sure that teens can do that. And with these new um, infotainment systems, it's like everything is on the screen. Right. And you really have to look at the screen. Right. There's, in order layers, to there's layers of those screens. Like if you want to turn on the heated seats in some vehicles, you need to like actually physically look at the screen, kind of go through a menu and then find the heated seat button. Like that is a distraction. And, and, you know, it's, it only comes with experience when that vehicle 
that, that, you know, really kind of helps you get past that. So, you know, I drive a lot of different things and, and that's the, that's the thing that I recognize more than anything is there's functions within these cars that I'm not familiar with that really take a cognitive load off of the driving and onto the, uh, the infotainment system. So it's, it's, it's something to be aware of and it really comes with experience. Okay. So let's just make it black and white for people. When shopping for a car for your teenager, whether it's new or pre-owned, make sure that you check out the infotainment system and see how easy it is for you to make all of those adjustments without taking your eyes off the road. Right. So very great piece of advice. I think that's so important. Things with buttons and knobs definitely help. You know, vehicles that have redundant controls, I think are key. Okay. So let's talk some more because, you know, um, Craig, manufacturers have really, they've come out with a lot of safety features on cars that also offer assistance to a driver like, and let's talk about a few of them, like blind spot monitoring. I love my blind spot monitoring, yep. right? Backup cameras. And you had mentioned earlier, traction and stability control. Are these all worth the money for a teenager's car? Why don't you go through a few of like those three at least yeah, and, I mean, and talk about that? You know, the, the blind spot monitoring is, is hugely helpful. Uh, you know, and, and we were talking about larger vehicles. If your teen happens to be driving something larger, it's, it's kind of key technology because you really don't know where the corners of those vehicles are. And, and, you know, the, it's, it's kind of odd, like the, 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 there's a paradox now that we've added a lot of roof strength to these vehicles. We've added airbags, but all of that has impacted visibility. So you really can't see as well out of a modern car as you can an older car. So blind spot monitoring, backup cameras, all of these things are not just helpful, they're becoming necessary so that you can understand, you know, your relation to other vehicles around you, especially backing out of parking spaces, you know, that that's, um, that's where like, uh, um, I can't, uh, rear cross traffic alert will. Right. Oh, right. I love no, that. It's great technology. <laughs> and you know, like how many times have you backed out of a parking spot where you felt like, wow, that was close. You know, I almost, I almost ran that guy over that kind of goes away with that. And, and for a teen driver, it's definitely helpful. And people will try to tell you like, oh no, you know, you don't want to give them any of that because they're not like practicing safe driving habits. I would rather have them not practice a safe driving habit than back over some guy that they didn't see. You know, that's what we're trying to prevent here. And that's true. Not just teens, everybody, everybody can, can help for, you know, can benefit from that. Even people with years of experience. Okay. So, so we like blind spot monitoring. Yes. I, I love my backup camera yes. and, and, and you, you already can said add that as well. You can like, if you don't have one on your kid's car, you can add that technology. It's inexpensive. You, you basically just replace the rear view mirror and they, you put a couple of camera, they put a camera near the, the rear license plate and you can have that technology in anything. So it's something to consider. So not everything uh, can be added on aftermarket. Right. But that is definitely one. So, um, and you had already said that, you know, you wish you had had traction and stability control on your daughter's Yep, car. can't add that technology, unfortunately. So that's like more modern vehicles. So, you know, you should be, you should be really keeping your eyes open in the 2010 and newer model years. That, those okay. are the kind of things I think are, are, you know, offer the best balance between cost and technology. Excellent. I love that. Okay. So, um, so don't you wish you could just be like a little, like just peeking in on your teenage drivers as they're going down the road, just to see how they're driving, but yes, you can. Yep. So they do have out, um, a number of different kinds of driver monitoring systems on the market. Right. Tell us about, about a few of them that you like and which ones you recommend and, and, uh, how easy it is to use. GM has has teen driving technology that allows you to kind of like every time they're driving the car, it will provide you a report that shows you how many miles they drove, how much the how many times the auto emergency braking went off, oh. how fast they were going, what their what their maximum speed was. So, you know, it is big brother technology. 
but it it does work and it does give you a it gives you a report card that shows you exactly what their driving habits are and you can kind of address those and either reward or punish or whatever uh, to to kind of get them to to have you know safer, safer driving habits this is surprising you'll you should use this yourself to see what your own driving habits are because you will be shocked at how bad you're driving the are. <laughs> That's so. <laughs> oh, if, if I can, if I can judge traffic around here, uh, you, you know the the teens are doing fine. It's their parents, oftentimes, that are that need this technology just as much. I learned it from watching you, Dad. Okay, so that one was called. So that's General Motors teen yep. driver technology. Is there another one that you've used? There are other. You know, there other manufacturers have similar similar types of technology. The thing that I used, which was key to me was uh, when my daughter got her driver, a learner's permit, um, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts makes you drive with your student driver 40 hours as a parent. I have to commit oh. to doing that. And I had to take a driving class. So I was in the car with her for 40 hours. Plus it was during the pandemic and they tacked on another 20 hours. Just, you know, so I did 60 hours with her. Now, how do you monitor that? They provided me with an app, the Road Ready app, and every time I got in the car with her, it tracked the time that I was driving with her, um, you know, when we were doing night hours, um, you know, it, it really was helpful in understanding how much time I spent in the car with her. Like, I don't think my dad spent five hours teaching me how to drive. He was a great guy, didn't spend a lot of time with this. I spent 60 hours in the car with her, Oh, you know, when she had the permit. So it was, it was great. It was, um, you know, very helpful to me um, to, to understanding, you know, what her driving habits were and, you know, kind of getting a better handle on how she was going to be as a driver by herself. Excuse me one second. There we go. Oh, I think that is amazing. I think I might be downloading that one when it's time for. Definitely do. Anybody can do it. The state recommended it, but you know, and even if your state doesn't, it's a great, great app to use. Oh my goodness. That's wonderful. Okay. So when it comes to driver monitoring, whether it's an app or a technology that's already inside the car, um, you do recommend it for yep. new drivers, right? Yep, for sure. And adults, apparently. Okay. Sure. <laughs> okay. So I love that we're talking about all this technology. There's so much technology. And technology, yes, it makes our lives better. It may make us safer. Um, you can add them on. Um, and of course, we want our kids to be safe. Um but uh, we also, I mean, I don't know about you, but I also don't want to spend $50,000 on a yeah. new car, Craig. That's so let's the, talk that's about the thing, right? You know, I'm, I'm getting ready to send my daughter to college and that, that expense is breathtaking. Adding another, you know, 35,000 plus to get her a new car is just, it's not, it's not feasible, you know, and, and, you know, this, this graph is at least a year old. Um, you know, the, the, price of new and used cars has gone through the roof over the last last year or so. So we're looking at $40,000 average new car prices and $25,000 used car prices. But you can kind of look at this and see how far back you can go, right? So if you look at the depreciation curve of, of an average used car, you can start to see like, well, 10 years in, a lot of this technology, that's 2012 now, which is amazing to me, you know, like 10 years old. It seems like <laughs> yesterday. But, you know, you can look at the curve here and at 10 years old, all of that technology is available and you're kind of at the low point of, of you know, uh, of depreciation. So, you know, this is a little skewed in 2021, 2022 because of the, the market. But in general terms, you can get a lot of the technology, still get a very reliable car that's going to last for, you know, 300,000 miles without an issue and, and save yourself an awful lot of money. And you're not going to feel as bad when they ding it up, you know, in a parking lot. Okay. So new car. Great to have, obviously, yeah. but not necessary. Like no. you can get a great pre-owned car that's perfect for teenagers and first-time drivers. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I I look at cars like, you know, I look at a vehicle like the Kia Soul, for example. They're cheap to start with. They're they're and they get cheaper on the used market. They're everywhere. They're reliable. They have tons of safety equipment. That's kind of a no-brainer. It's a little small, but it's probably not a bad thing, especially when kids are, you know, kind of getting started 
driving around town, you know, that scale of car to me, that's like an ideal teen, teen vehicle, you know, not going to get in a lot of trouble with a soul. Yeah, I know. And they're kind of cool. They're kind of <laughs> cool. Okay. Um, okay. Cause I want to, I want to talk about this cause I thought this was really, really interesting in your article. If I recall correctly, Craig, you had said that you uh, had your daughter make a sizable investment into the price of the car. Now she didn't pay for the whole thing. I think nope. she paid for half. Was it? Yeah. Um, so I committed that I would, I would up to $3,500. I would pay half of whatever she decided to buy. Now, I went out and bought myself a Jeep Wrangler, a 2003. I had a great summer with it. And then at the end of the summer, she was like, I would really like that. Oh, so, she, that was her choice. That was her choice. So, okay. so I drove it and had a blast with it. And I would still be driving it today if she didn't decide that she <laughs> wanted it. She worked for two summers, put a bunch of money away and said, all right, uh, you know, I'll give you 3,500 for it. And, and so we were square. And so, you know, is a Jeep Wrangler the safest vehicle that a teen could be driving? Absolutely not. <laughs> however, however, and this is, this is one thing about that Wrangler that I love is that at 65 miles an hour, it feels like you're doing about 120. Yeah. So she keeps the speeds pretty low in that. And it's mostly around town driving. You know, it's got a roll cage. It's got a seat belt. It's good seat belts. It's got an airbags. It's got, you know, the basics of what I would consider to be. Uh, good safety technology. Had I had it to do again, I would have I would have found her a later one uh, that had traction control and stability control. Uh, I, you know, I th I think that's a kind of a minimum minimum requirement at this point for a new driver. Okay, but why? It, oh, why? Because yeah. I wanted her to have some. I wanted to have some investment in it. I wanted her to like feel the pain if something. You know, if if, if she you know, got in an accident or treated it badly or wasn't paying attention to the way the car was driving or any of that stuff. I think she's got a little bit of money in and she feels like some sense of responsibility with that car. Okay. So we call that skin in the game. Got it. No, I And it totally saved me 3,500 bucks. Let's get you know. Well, there's <laughs> that. Okay. Cause uh, you're, you're absolutely right. When I get my son a uh, expensive pair of sneakers that I should have shaken, shaken my head and said, no way. Um, he takes better care of the sneakers he buys with his own money. Right. So I imagine that once I get to that point, a car would not be too much different. Correct. Um, so very, very interesting. Um, one of the things that I know I have uh, talked about, not just with my son, but also with the hubs, who is obviously a motorhead, right? Yeah. Um uh, I feel like every driver, and I know when I first started driving all those years ago, um, I feel that every new driver should have some basic automotive know-how, you know, so they, they don't get stuck by the road not knowing how to change a tire, for instance, you know. Um, they should know how to check their tires to make sure that they're, uh, you know, uh, still up to par, how to change a flat why you need oil, how, how to check your fluids, you know, right. why it's important to have all those fluids topped off, what each one of them does, you know, simple maintenance yep. um, for vehicles that, that'll obviously make the car last longer. But I was just wondering what you thought. I mean, you, you're a dad of a teen driver. Did you do that? What, what would you recommend when, with a new driver? So, on uh, you know, I, I think, you know, you, you're, you're almost guided by what, what your teen, what your teen's capacity for interest is in doing that, right? So if you've got a kid who is really interested in the car and really interested in how they work, by all means, like let's go out in the driveway, let's figure out how to change a tire, let's let's do all these things. But at the minimum, and and you know, my my daughter's not all that interested in in you know learning how to rebuild a carburetor. No. Or but <laughs> the key thing is that she will alert me if anything is wrong with that car. Like, Hey, I noticed that, you know, my turn signal is out or, you know, it kind of makes a funny noise when I'm going around a corner. That's what I'm looking for. Because at that point we can talk about it and address it like, you know, and we'll get it fixed. So, you know, we've done that several times. Like, you know, I don't know, this just doesn't sound right to me. And sure enough, you know, the idler pulley on the, uh, you, you know, for the, for the belt is squeaking and we need to get that replaced. Like, great. Like that's the minimum. I would really rather not have a kid standing by the highway 
with cars whizzing by at 80 miles an hour changing a tire. It's it's really dangerous. Nobody should be doing it. Like, you know, figure let's figure out a better way to do that. I would rather have a kid drive a mile on the rim to get off the highway to get to a safe place um, rather than try to change it beside the highway. That is a great point and a conversation that we should all have with our teens. Yeah. I love that. Um, and, um, you know, along with that basic automotive education, Craig, you've also said that when it comes to driving, there is absolutely no substitute for education and yeah. experience. And I wish they sold that in stores, but they don't. They so don't. So, Craig, <laughs> tell the parents out there about your recommendations when it comes to training new drivers. So, you know, this we do a terrible job in this country training. Drivers. Do we? We really do. <laughs> I mean, like driver's ed is is like basically how to avoid getting a parking ticket or getting, a, you know, like it's, it's, <laughs> I'll tell you this, the Massachusetts driver's manual, half of it is about like, here are the things you're going to get a ticket for. And here's how you can lose your license. Like, teach the kids how to drive the car. So, so I am very enthusiastic about the uh, teen driving classes that the manufacturers are investing in. So really? Ford, Ford has one, Kia has one. Um, uh, many of the manufacturers do. They're free. The problem is they're not scalable. So they're not going to get every kid through. So you really need to pay attention when those things come to your town and get your kids enrolled. They're great, great programs. Um, the, the other thing is like, I mean, if there's an opportunity to pay or some of your local retailers even will have, will run these programs. It was a Volvo dealer, not far from here that whether you bought a car there or not, they would, they would run a free, uh, driver training program for teens, uh, and, and run your, run your kid through it. But again, like every kid is not going to have that opportunity. So, you know, it's, it's key to, spend a little extra time. You know, we talked about the 60 hours that, that, that my state uh, required me to go through with them. That was very helpful, I think. Um, and if you can write a check and have a kid spend, you know, a little bit of extra time in actual driver training, it's, it's very helpful. They'll teach them how ABS works. Number one, most of you dads and moms out there, you're still pumping the brakes. I know you're doing it. You don't need to. And it really takes somebody to explain that to a teen driver that, you know, with ABS, you need to slam the brakes on and put your brake right, put the brake pedal right to the floor and steer around the obstacle. That's why ABS is there. Um, if you start pumping the brakes, ABS gets very confused and it doesn't work the way it's supposed to. So that's something that like your dad isn't going to teach you. Same thing with traction control and stability control. How do those technologies work? You need driver education that is modern and not based on, you know, 1960s kind of attitudes about driving a car. So I was any opportunity to get that. into a class like that. I was just talking about that with my kid. I was like, hey, when I learned to drive, it was, you know, 10 and two, and now it's nine and three and right. other things. And because of the advent of technology, yeah. Yep. Pumping the brakes is no longer necessary. Correct. Um, uh, you know, that is so great. Okay. I just want to remind people um, because you, you said it kind of fast. So Ford offers a driver training program. Kia offers one. It's called Brakes. Correct. Um, there's another one called putonthebrakes.org for you yep. to check out, which is awesome site. So check that one out. Those are free teen driving schools that, that OEMs like Kia have. Yeah. And this Boy, oh, program Boy. in particular, um, the, the two, uh, uh, teens that are in the photo there, they were the sons of a drag racer who were killed in, in a car accident. And he developed this program on his own and, um, you know, kind of, kind of got Kia involved and they, they run this, yeah, this guy, this guy's name's Doug Hebert. And we, we wrote, we wrote about him in Best Ride um, years ago. So, you know, definitely look into this program. A lot of these things obviously have been sort of suspended due to the pandemic, but like, I would imagine that these programs are going to come back uh, in a big way over the next few years, um, you know, as, as, you know, we try to make up some lost time, uh, make up for some lost time due to the pandemic. Oh, I love, I love this. I'm totally going to look into this. A uh, couple comments that came in, Beth. 
wrote back in. She says, this is a great idea. We all appreciate things more when we have our own money invested in it. Thank you so much, Beth. I love hearing from you. And then uh, Steve Schaefer also wrote in. He said, that's a great point about knowing how to change a tire. However, I think some people think they know how to change a tire, but actually haven't done it. I think it'd be a great idea to have my child actually perform the tire change for real. Oh yeah. And oil change too. I'm all over that. Steve, I'm with you, kid. All right. So thank you so much for those comments. And um, gosh, we are cruising through some, all these fantastic tips. We just have a couple more and then we'll start closing out the show. Um, uh, we have reached the one tip that I myself cannot imagine not getting for my teen driver. So let's talk about some kind of a roadside assistance program. Um, and as any one of you who has ever had to use it will tell you, yes, it's a game changer. So for talk sure. to me, Craig, about w why you would recommend a roadside assistance program for a team. So driver. this gets to the the, the issue what, that we talked about before about changing a tire beside the highway. Uh, like AAA, I don't care who you go with, cross country, whoever the roadside assistance program is, get that happening because, you know, if, if a kid's out there and they're, you know, the, the weather's bad or whatever it is, it's a busy highway. They run out of gas. They run out of gas. They get locked out. You know, all of these things are helpful. The, the, the thing to understand too, is you may have roadside assistance covered in three different ways. Your insurance company might provide it. If you have an extended warranty on the car, it often provides a, a really good, uh, roadside assistance program. There's, you know, the triple A's of the world that are great, but you know, and, and also if you break down in anybody's vehicle, if you're in a Kia, you can call Kia and they will pick that car up. Now, th what they're going to do is bring it to a Kia, to Kia dealer. They're not going to bring it to your local mechanic. So if you want to actually have some control over where you're going to bring it, make sure that you have a AAA or one of those kind of roadside assistance programs that'll do that for you. But I love the, you know, kids always run out of gas. I did it a million times. I never had roadside assistance because my parents were cheap. Spend the money. And by the, by, like, I like AAA plus, honestly, because I feel like I have a hundred miles of free towing that I've used. I used a hundred miles of it one time getting towed from New Hampshire to Vermont. So, so I would, uh, I would definitely recommend upgrading to the, uh, to whatever the upgrade is. Oh, I love this advice, Craig. Thank you so much. I love this. Okay. So that was an amazing amount of fantastic information, uh, to help us get ready to help buy a car for our teens without, you know, hopefully pulling our hair out. So let's go over like some kind of a checklist or whatever, uh, last advice for parents, um, and for teens for that matter. So let's talk about, uh, like, We've already said, okay, talk to your teens about not speeding, talk to them about not texting, wear their seat belts. Let's keep going on this, Craig. Um, I mean, I, I would I would definitely, uh, you know, encourage them to be exceedingly cautious at night. Uh, you know, if if kids are, you know, if kids are getting in accidents, statistics show that it's often happening after dark and after nine o'clock, it's, you know, like the, that sort of goes right up the scale. Obviously, you don't want kids drinking and driving or smoking marijuana and driving or anything under the influence just adds another layer on top of that. And, and like the, the likelihood of something bad happening just goes right off the charts. So you want to have those conversations, um, you know, and, and definitely I, I, I think it's important to really get them to understand how the car's operating. And, and if there are things that are not operating the way they should, they should be, you know, able to alert you and, and, and kind of figure out, you know, what's going on, get the car to a mechanic or, Hey, that's normal. That's the way the car should work. Um, so I think it's that communication thing between parents and teens that are, that, that is really key. Yeah. I would also throw in there as you've just recently experienced with your own daughter, that weather plays yeah. a role in accidents, even when it's sunny, yep. you know, yeah. The time of the day, as you had said, but even when it's sunny, whether it's rainy, whether it's, you know, and, and a lot of times, you know, I, 
the accident isn't the teenager's fault. Right. You know, they have to watch out for other drivers and animals. What do you do when there's an animal in the road? And of course, the, the first instinct is swerve, right. miss the animal. At some point, you're going to have to have that conversation where <laughs> if the animal is small, it's <laughs> yeah. the animal. I know that's terrible to say. It is, but I'd rather that have them hit the small animal than swerve and roll the car. Yeah, and and that's where you know technologies like stability control really really help. Um, you know, years ago it was you know you you would do that and you would be off in the bushes somewhere, and the addition of stability control really reduced the severity of that, even if it did happen. So you know, those are the technologies that are uh, that are really you know important to understand too. Yeah, and um, I would even. Uh also talk to teenagers as well about their responsibility. Yes, it's for the car and it's for all the other cars around them, but it's also for the safety of whatever passengers are yeah. in their car. And that, and that driving is a privilege. It's not a right. If you don't take it seriously, you don't have to keep that car. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, a lot of kids are, you know, in, in, depending on the state you're in, you have a graduated license that, prevents you from driving with passengers for a period of time in order to give you some, some time behind the wheel by yourself where you're not distracted by your friends, but also kind of takes that responsibility and, and pushes it down the road a little bit until you understand, like, I'm responsible for everybody in this vehicle. I'm also responsibility, responsible for making sure all those other people wear their seatbelt. So you're, you're the boss of that car when you're, when, when you're behind the wheel. So take that responsibility seriously. This was just amazing, Craig. Thank you so much. I feel better prepared already. Yeah, um, good luck. Good luck. We'll compare notes when it's time. I know, get back with me in two years. Okay. So I did want to point out um, that, uh, Craig, and thank you so much for everything you've done today to improve uh, teen driver safety. I do want to let y'all know out there in the audience, next month's bestride.com Facebook live guest is actually going to be a representative from the Institute of Highway Safety. And they also offer free resources for teen drivers. We're going to find out all of that and more when that guest shows up next month. Don't worry. We're going to tell you all about it in the next couple of weeks. But uh, that's a big one for us to get somebody from the Institute of Highway Safety to also come out here and talk to us about some of the safest cars on the road and what you could do to make all of your drives as safe as possible. So be on the lookout for that. And um, of course, Craig, I got to thank you. This was Every time you come, you bring the fire, and today was no different. And I love catching up with you. Always um, a blast. I love it. It really is. And audience, I want to let you know, Craig, yeah, he, he only shows up every couple of months or whatever with all this great information. But you know what? You can find out more about him and what he's doing at bestride.com on his newest blog. It's just come out. So uh, what you're writing about this time, Craig? We, Talk to we me. We wrote something about uh, what the difference between Hyundai's end vehicles and the end line vehicles are. So that Hyundai's got performance cars and they are great. So really? um, yeah, yeah. And they're really fantastic. So uh, definitely check out check out that blog post and see what the difference is because the naming convention is a little confusing. It is. Uh, I can't wait to read about it. And and yes, audience, you can find that blog at bestride.com. We love it. Um, by the way, just in case you didn't know, Best Ride is the smartest, easiest way to find a car online by showing you numerous vehicles to consider and helping you narrow it down to the one that's right for you. So you can search by body style, you can connect with local car dealers, you can read car reviews like from our friend Craig Fitzgerald himself. Um, you can uh, check out industry news, uh, auto related news, you can uh, search by new used certified pre owned. Oh my gosh, you can do all that and search within your zip code. I mean, it's a great time to buy a car. And you know what? Best ride can help search millions of cars find your best ride. And uh, yes, there it is, bestride.com. Amazing website. So if you haven't checked it out, please do so. Make sure to spend some special time on the news and blog portions of bestride.com so you can get up to date on what's happening with your favorite rides on bestride.com. Now, Craig, I love you, my buddy. It's going to be a I few months before too. I see you again. So 
Uh, thank you so much for being here with us today. Anytime. Oh. We'll see you soon. Yes, sir. Uh, audience, if you have any questions, comments, or suggestions regarding our broadcasts and our topics, hey, I'd love to hear from you. If you have any topic ideas, please let me know. My name is Eliana Raggio, and you can reach me directly at Eliana at bestride.com. On behalf of Craig Fitzgerald and the rest of the amazing crew at bestride.com, thank you all so very much for spending this time with us today. I hope to see you all on another broadcast from us, your friends at bestride.com. Take care, everyone. <laughs>